moment. I am an assistant professor at the Department of English, Ewing Christian College, Allahabad. The topic of my lecture today is an overview of Indian feminist poetry, 1900 to the present. This is paper 2 of module 13. In India, one of the earliest instances of a confident woman strongly expressing her views is found in Lok Mudra's hymn in the Rig Veda, prefiguring the French feminist ideas of a frank expression of sexual desire, Lokmudra berates her ascetic husband, Agastya, for ignoring his wife's sexual needs. Legends cite other instances of Maitri and Gargi, who debated philosophical issues with the rishis of yore. Buddha permitted nuns into the fold of his monastic order. Hymns written by Buddhist nuns cover all aspects of life from asceticism to social to familial. Mainstream Brahminical Hinduism, though monolithic and patriarchal, nevertheless has pretenses of gynocentrism with its narratives of Devi in her local as well as pan-Indian avatars. However, it was the medieval age bhakti movement that was truly the time of women's liberation in India. The bhakti movement was the most successful form of feminism in the historiography of Indian feminism because it cuts across region, class and caste and embraced women. Mirabai, Andal, Lalde and many others are the true women libbers of India. William Dalrymple in Nine Lives talks of the throwbacks of this medieval tradition when he describes a woman, the keeper of the shrine of cremation ghats of Bengal's Tarapi as psychologically and financially free and well integrated in society. During the British Raj, the Indian feminist movement was given an impetus by men, Englishmen, Europeans and educated Indians who raised their voices against social malpractices inimical to women like Sati and the treatment of widows in Hindu society. Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Gandhi, Vivekanand, Dayanand Saraswati are just a few names of those men who spoke out against child marriage and supported the cause of widow remarriage. During India's struggle for independence, Gandhi's role in inspiring women to join the cause and offer their services to the cause gave an immense fillip to the image and material condition of the ordinary Indian woman both in the cities and the villages. Centuries of relegation were swept aside as the wave of confidence and resurgence brought out the Indian woman from her puja room, her home, her heath and her fields right into the maelstrom of the struggle for independence. Inspired by the Mahatma in urban as well as rural settings, women of all classes and castes came together with the men folk to support the cause of overthrowing the foreign yoke. After 1947 and ever since the 1960s, Western feminism impacted the Indian feminist movement in urban metropolitan centers and most importantly in the academia. In the Indic tradition, despite there being 
the strong voices of women expressing themselves in oral or written literatures, there is no doubt that these voices have been subordinated and marginalized. Hence, the need for women's studies to conceptualize and theorize means of critically analyzing women's writing. It is hoped this selection will reflect women's real experiences and the real world they inhabit. The works of many women writers of times gone by have been examined through gendered lenses, their work diluted or even denounced by a male critic reviewing it. The literary productions of many women writers have often been read, edited and published by male family members or friends resulting in this phallic criticism, defeminizing and sanitizing the subversive nature of the writing. There is a pressing need for researchers to reopen and re-examine these texts from a feminist angle to restore them to their original glory, to bring back into focus how these texts spell out their feminist challenge to a male world. In the early 20th century in India, the case of Muddupalini's Radhika Santvanam reviewed re-edited and reprinted by Bangalore Nagaratnama in 1910 is a good case in point. In the early 20th century in India, the Raj having attempted a colonial restructuring of gender, there was this immense pressure of Victorian values affecting women's literary production and consumption. It is interesting to trace how Indian femininity was remodeled in the early 20th century to produce the proper Indian lady. Sarojini Naidu's life and poetic over that spanned centuries may be read in this light when Indian women writers of the 19th century were grappling with the recast Indian femininity governed by Victorian dictates. However, with the coming of independence and a great churning having occurred in the political and imaginative life of the nation. Indian women poets have struggled with the idea of nation, national identity and with the gradual disenchantment with the golden dream of, ne of Nehruvian socialism and development. Despite constitutional provisions, the lot of women has not improved. Patriarchy, class, caste, religion, orthodoxy, regionalism and poverty continue to exercise an immense pressure on the Indian woman who by and large remains victimized and marginalized in society. Nevertheless, 
the picture is not all that bleak. Over the years in 20th century India, the middle class Indian woman has managed to secure a corner for herself in the arena of literary production. Amrita Pritam is the best known woman poet in Punjabi and a central figure in the women's literary movement in India in the 70s and the 80s. A prolific writer, she has written poems, short stories, novels, essays and autobiography. As a victim and a refugee during the savage Hindu-Muslim rights of the partition, Amrita Pritam was able to express in modern poetry her first-hand experience of the horror and deep anguish of that time. In her famous poem, E Akhan Varish Shanu, she describes the plight of women hurt, tortured, raped, and widowed during the partition. The speaking voice in the poem appeals to Varish Shah, the 18th century Sufi saint poet of Punjab, famous for his epic love poem, He Ranja, to speak out against the insanity and in humanity that have covered the rivers of the Punjab red. I would like to recite some lines from the poem Aj Akha Varis Shahnu. I exhort you, Varisha, speak from your grave today. Add a new page to your book of love today. Once, a daughter of Punjab wept. You wrote your saga of love that day. A thousand daughters weep, calling out to you today. Arise, O friend of the afflicted. Arise and see the state of Punjab. Corpses strewn in fields bloody flows the chenab. Someone fill the riv five rivers with poison. This water now irrigates our soil. The flute that played songs of love is lost or Ranjas knowing how to play it having forgot. Blood has rained on the soil. Graves are oozing blood. Distraught princesses of love cry their hearts out at tombs. All the Quadans have become thieves of beauty and love today. Where we can find another one like Varisha today. Varisha, only you can speak from the depths of the grave. To you, I say today, add a new page to your epic of love this day. By and large, Indian feminist critics are of the view that given the country's plurality and its diverse cultures, numerous patriarchies and manifold feminisms coexist simultaneously. Hence, one way of looking at modern Indian women's poetry in India is to interpret it via certain broad trends. 
One discerns a strain of liberal moderate feminism that roots for equal opportunities for women by desiring reform over revolution. Then there is the strain of radical feminism, no doubt influenced by the 1963 publication of Betty Friedman's The Feminine Mystique, which urged women to explore their true feminine self in education and career rather than confining themselves to wifehood and motherhood. Socialist feminism with its stress on capital, private property and class being the major causes of women's oppression also impacts modern and contemporary women's poetry in India. And lastly, there are a few instances of lesbian feminism believing that an exclusively female sexuality can awaken women to new possibilities. Hira Bansod is a poet who writes in Marathi and brings in a feminist stance in Dalit poetry. A well-known woman poet, she has imaged the Dalit woman as doubly oppressed, beaten like a drum at both ends. Her poems give voice to the dreams, unfulfilled aspirations, deep hurt and anguish of women in general. The title of a poem, Bosom Friend, is ironic. It reveals the helplessness and despair of a low caste woman when her upper caste female friend fails to live up to her expectations. It exposes the hypocrisy of a caste ridden modern Indian society with the protagonist of the poem feeling badly let down with the coming of the realization that the distance between class and caste in India is so deeply entrenched that it may as well never be bridged. I would like to recite the poem, Bosom Friend. Today you came over to dinner for the first time. You not only came, you forgot your caste and came. Usually, women don't forget that tradition of inequality, but you came with a mind as large as the sky to my pocket size house. You came bridging the chasm that divides us. Truly, friend, I was really happy. With the naive devotion of Shabari, I arranged the food on your plate. But the moment you looked at the plate, your face changed. With a smirk, you said, Oh my, do you serve chutney koshambir this way? You still don't know how to serve food. Truly, you folks will never improve. I was ashamed, really ashamed. My hand which had just touched the sky was knocked down. I was silent. Towards the end of the meal, you asked, what's that? Don't you serve buttermilk or yogurt with the last course of rice? Oh, my dear, we can't do without that. Imtiaz Dharkar lives in the UK and calls herself a British Pakistani now. However, her first three books of poetry were written while she was living in Mumbai, India. Dharka's poetry grapples with gender issues, religious pressures, communal violence, and geographical and cultural displacement. Her first book of poems, Parda, interweaves the complexities of being a woman with an Indian 
Muslim identity. I would like to recite the poem Parda. One day they said she was old enough to learn some shame. She found it came quite naturally. Parda is a kind of safety. The body finds a place to hide. The cloth fans out against the skin, much like the earth that falls on coffins after they put dead men in. People she has known stand up, sit down, as they have always done. But they make different angles in the light, their eyes aslant a little shy. She half remembers things from someone else's life, perhaps from yours or mine. Carefree, carrying what we do not know. Between the thighs, a sense of sin. We sit still, letting the cloth grow, a little closer to our skin. A light filters inward through our body's walls. Voices speak inside us, echoing in the places we have just left. She stands outside herself, sometimes in all four corners of a room. Wherever she goes, she is always inching past herself, as if she were a clod of earth, and the roots as well, scratching for a hold between the first and second rib, passing constantly out of her own hands, in the corner of someone else's eyes, while the doors keep opening inward and again inward. There are the they who dominate and control, the tentative, tenuous she who must learn to live her life beneath a veil. Shame, a sense of sin between the thighs are the early lessons of her life. Soon, all sense of agency is eroded. She is always standing outside herself always inching past herself, passing constantly out of her own hands, till for the confused and perplexed female self, the containing, circumscribing parda is both threat and solace, offering a grave like safety and an interior world where doors constantly keep on opening inwards. The poem unfolds gently, the tone is even and balanced and expertly underscores the sense of menace and oppression threatening to engulf the fragile female self. Men, society, religion and culture are all implicated in the sophisticated drama of unseen and unheard psychological violence that succeeds in diminishing the female self. In this poem, we see how the feminist voice of Indian poetry challenges the dictates of religion and culture and forces the reader to face issues of containment and oppression. Another poem which comes to my mind is titled what poetry means to Ernestina in peril, and I would like to recite it. What should poetry means to a woman in the hills? As she sits one long sloping summer evening in Petria, as all, her head crammed with contrary winds, pistoling the clever stars that seem to say, ignoring the problems which will not make it go away. So what if Ernestina is not a name at all, not even a corruption, less than a monument? She will sit pulling on one thin cigarillo after another, will lift her teacup in friendly greeting to the hills and loquacious stars, 
and the music will comb on through her hair, telling her, Poetry must be raw like a side of beef, should drip blood, remind you of sweat and dusty slaughter and the epidermal crunch and the sudden bullet to the head. So what if the roses are in disarray? She will rise with a look of terror, too real to be comical. The conspiracy in the greenhouse, the committee of good women, they have marked her down. They are coming, the dead dogs, the yellow popes. They are coming, the choristers of stone. We have been bombed silly out of our minds. Waiter, bring me something cold and hard to drink. Somewhere there is a desert waiting for me and someday I will walk into it. In this poem, Mona Zot correlates writing, gender and reading in the opening lines. What should poetry mean to a woman in the hills? The woman is searching for meaning and stability in her life as she feels vacuous and schizophrenic because she lives in a land where babies are ripped out of the graves. Religion is monolithic and authoritarian and churchmen are goons and hoods. Munazod brings to light the complex socio-cultural history of Mizoram, a people, a conglomerate of several ethnic groups whose tribal heritage, animistic religion, and oral culture were successively eroded by the British and the Christian missionaries, and then the Indian state. Long years of insurgency and the violence that comes with it are the reason why the individual is hysterical, feels hounded by conspiracy, dead dogs, yellow popes, and choristers of stone. The unnatural heart situation affects one and all and the individual aligns with the community and kinsmen, making the personal, the political end. We have been bomb silly out of our mind. The future is bleak and the eye can imagine not an Eden, but only an arid desert waiting for her to walk into. The poet skillfully uses two voices the outer and the inner, hysterical, italicized one, in order to dramatize the split and the slow disintegration of the threatened individual self. This poem is a good illustration of how the cultural and political history of a particular region of India, in this case, Mizoram, northeastern India, gives birth to a feminist voice, unmistakably individual and distinct. Thus, we see, for India in the 20th century, just as the polity has evolved, so have the feminisms, affected by rural, urban, class, caste, religious and regional considerations. Just as these varied feminisms are expressed politically in Indian society, so are they in the poems written by a slew of women poets in India. Indian women's poetry has embraced and mirrored it all.